Anytime you browse to a website on the internet, you look at the display of a computer monitor, or you interact with your mobile phone, you're using a highly sophisticated optoelectronics component. Now, these devices are becoming increasingly ubiquitous today. For example, if you look at the display of a mobile phone, not only is there a very sophisticated monitor, there's also a laser pointed directly at your face in order to make the proximity sensor work. Whenever you browse to a website on the internet, the data travels at very high speeds through optical fibers like the one I have here behind me. So if I take the cap off of this optical fiber, we can see that there's light coming out of the end. Now in this case, the optical fiber here is relatively short. We have a red laser mounted here, so that's the light that you're seeing. In the case of the internet, there would be thousands of kilometers of such optical fiber. These optical fibers are all over the place. In order to send data at high speeds down these optical fibers, we have to turn the lasers on and off really quickly. A laser turning on and off just represents ones and zeros in the digital data stream. It's actually an engineering challenge to get lasers to turn on and off really quickly without causing their power to be reduced so much that the lasers aren't usable. So one of the students in our lab has one of these lasers mounted in a setup that he's built here on the optical table. He's working on high-speed lasers. I'd like to introduce you to Jun Da. Oh, hello. Let's go over and take a look at the laser he has mounted. This is a setup that I've built to characterize the lasers that we fabricated here. So right in there is the laser chip and you have two electrical probes. This is the camera and right on the screen is what the camera is seeing. Right, these two shadows are the electrical probes. You have the top and the bottom contact and the diameter of this laser is roughly 40 microns across. 40 microns? Yeah. Well, let's turn it on. Okay, so uh, let me put on my laser safety goggles first. Oh right, this is an invisible laser so we want to be yeah. careful. Yeah. So there it's lazy. Lazing. So it's, it's invisible to us, but it's not invisible to the camera. camera. So behind us here is one of the smaller clean rooms we have here at the university. Uh, this is one that we typically use for semiconductor device fabrication. So we're going to go inside and have a look at some of the equipment. And to do that, we need to get gowned up first. This machine you see here is our metal evaporator which we use to deposit electrical contacts like the one you see here. Next we have our electron beam lithography unit which we use to make really fine patterns. Next we have our yellow room which is our optical lithography room. The machine you see here is our ion miller which we use to add structures on our chips. So finally we have our step profiler. We use the step profiler to measure the height of the structures that we etched. So thank you, Junda, for showing us some of the machines that you use in your experiments. Now I'd like to go over to one of our other labs and introduce some of our quantum optics work. So what I'm holding in my hand now is an external optical modulator. In the other lab, we saw that one way to send data at high speeds down an optical fiber line is just to turn a laser on and off really quickly. But it turns out there are physical limits to how fast you can do that. In this device, a laser enters through one end and exits through the other side. Now the laser is always on. What this device does is it serves to just chop up the beam into the digital ones and zeros. This device allows much higher data rates than just using a laser directly would be able to give you. These are used, for example, for transoceanic fiber communications. This is a fairly large package, but inside is basically just a piece of glass. It's not ordinary glass, it's a special kind of glass called lithium niobate. It's an example of a nonlinear optical material. These devices are fairly expensive. This retails for about 4,000 US dollars. Now in our lab, we also make some of these modulators. This is an example of a set of lithium niobate modulators all fabricated onto a single chip. So although the package you just saw was fairly large, we actually have about 30 of these modulators all fabricated onto the same chip. So you could imagine this chip being diced apart and each little piece could go into one of these large packages. So it's a fairly lucrative field given how expensive these devices are. So what we try to do in this lab is research methods of making the optical modulators work faster and take up less chip area.
As I mentioned, this is not an ordinary piece of glass. What's very interesting about this material is that if you apply a voltage to the material, then the refractive index will change. And we use that change of refractive index to build the modulator. If you apply a voltage across an ordinary piece of glass, nothing will happen. The way a modulator works is as follows. Light enters from one end of the modulator, as you can see in the clip. As the light propagates, it hits a Y junction and then splits. Now normally, the two paths are of equal length and the light recombines and you get constructive interference. If you want the light to be switched off at the output, you apply a voltage across one of the arms of the modulators and that changes the refractive index of that arm just enough so that when the light exits the modulator, you'll have destructive interference. So we use this nonlinearity to make modulators. So this work has commercial applications. But what's interesting about these nonlinear optical materials is that there are applications in quantum optics as well. For example, these nonlinear optical materials can be used to generate entangled photon pairs, they can be used for second harmonic generation, and they can be used generally for on-ship optical information processing. In the clip, you saw an example of an on-ship optical interferometer. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Chiloa because he's built an optical interferometer here on the optical table and I think he'd like to tell you about it. Hi, uh, optical interferometer is a fundamental but also very important setup in the research area of optics, quantum optics and metrology. Right now we have an example of the interferometer which is built on the optical bench here. An interferometer normally consists of several parts. First, the laser source, second, the pips liter, third, several couples of mirrors, and fourth, normally which is a linear translation stage. The laser source produces a coherent collimated beam, and the beam is split into two propagation directions by the beam splitter. And the two portions of the beam are reflected back into the beam splitter again by using the mirrors. And at the end of the interferometer, we mainly observe the intensity of the light. Right now, the key point of the interferometer is that by adjusting the distance between one mirror and the beam splitter, we can clearly observe the change of the intensity, like showing right now. The change of the intensity is sensitive in the nanometer scale, which brings a huge application in the industry and the area of the research as well. Yeah, thank you very much for telling us about your optical interferometer. In fact, a lot of the students and staff tend to build their own setups on these tables. We also like to work with undergraduate students in the lab, and if you look up at the ceiling, you'll see some of our solar aircraft. These are actually really fun projects that the students tend to work on. The solar quadcopter that you're seeing now is actually the world's first completely solar-powered quadcopter that was able to lift itself out of the ground effect. It's just an incredible amount of fun to go outside and to try to fly these things. There's just so little power available from the sun that it's very difficult for these aircraft to lift their own weights. We have a new team of undergraduate students that are working on the next iteration of the solar quadcopter that I'd like to introduce you to. The key objective of our project is to create a solar quadcopter that's much smaller than the ones our predecessors have created. To achieve this, we are using gallium arsenide solar cells and creating a very lightweight frame by setting mylar in tension. Okay, what I'm holding is a piece of gallium arsenide triple junction solar cells and it has a very high efficiency of 29% compared to the silicon solar cells that it used previously. And the another advantage of this solar cell is that they are paper thin and near weightless. A pump size of this solar cell is only 1 gram. Our frame is about 80% thinner and lighter compared to our predecessor. Our main principle is to use mylar film in tension and we can use much thinner carbon fiber rods as well. Currently, we are working on tuning the PID controller of this quadcopter. I think the job market in optoelectronics is pretty good. If you look at the jobs bank here in Singapore, you can see at least 30 or 40 openings for PhD holders in optoelectronics field. Now, some of my former students are earning salaries higher than me, so I'm not so sure if academia is the best choice, but industrially, this field is really strong. I've got students scattered around the world. I've got some in New York, Australia, I've got one in France, there's a professor now in Pakistan, I have former students in China and some in Singapore. Let's see, where's Gerline? Uh, she's in France. France, okay, so I have two former PhD students in France. 
anyway, I think the future is looking very bright for optical electronics. You know, someday in the future we're going to have these fully immersive 3D holographic environments. I mean, that in itself is an optical electronics challenge. But just think of the data that the Internet of the Future is going to have to provide. I think that the research here is also quite a lot of fun. You know, we play around with the lasers and have a lot of fun in the lab. So I think it's, it's also a fun field to go into.